like you to turn with me to the second epistle of Peter. And we will read one through four. And for the initial reading of the Word of God, I would like to invite all of you to stand for this reading and remain standing for a brief prayer. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. May we pray. Father of heaven, we do thank you for the reading of your word tonight. We pray, Father, that you will let your word sink into our hearts and cause us to have a closer relationship with you. I pray tonight, Father, that you would be with me and through your Holy Spirit, let me be able to speak words, Father, that will comfort our hearts and help us to come to know you in a real and living way. Bless each of us tonight, Father. We do pray this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. 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 When one reads the words of the Apostle Peter in the second verse of the first chapter of Second Peter, we find these words, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Tonight, we're going to study this verse. And I would like for us to understand something of the grace of God and what that means. I want us to understand something of the peace that passes all understanding that the Apostle Peter spoke of. I want us as believers to come to understand what it really means for the grace of God and his peace to be multiplied to us. And I want us to understand tonight as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ of what it really means through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. When one looks at the words grace and peace. One very quickly discovers that these two words are very pregnant in meaning. They are words that create joy within the heart of every believer. Amen. With the coming of Christ, one sees the real meaning of grace. With Jesus our Lord, it is seen in action. It is heard in speech. And it is observed in personality. This grace of God that Peter speaks of creates peace within the heart of man. It creates a sense of blessedness in the heart of every 
individual. It provides essential assurance about God's love. It creates peace within the heart of us all. It reunites God and man. But this grace, this peace, Peter tells us, that it is only through the knowledge of God Amen. and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Though the apostles employed grace and peace in their letters as a form of greetings, it is more than just simply saying hello or goodbye. Peter says grace and peace through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Without God and Jesus, one can neither experience spiritual grace nor peace. Amen. Paul says that in the ages to come, Amen. he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 7. In the Ephesian letter, Paul reminds Christians of what God has done for them and through them in the Lord Jesus Christ. When one grasps the completeness of justification or one standing or status in the presence of God because of his grace, he or she will find that peace that passes all understanding. The chief end and object of salvation is the glory of almighty God. This, brothers and sisters in Christ, is what grace is all about. It is God's desire, says Peter, to multiply grace and peace through Jesus Christ. When one reflects upon God's grace, one is confronted with the question, why did God send his son, Jesus Christ? The answer to that question is that God sent his son so as to demonstrate his mercy and vindicate himself. Amen. That is, vindicating and declaring and showing the truth concerning himself, that he is a God of mercy, but yet a God of justice. How can God be just, and yet the justifier of sinful man? The answer is Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, God exhibits his grace, his justice, and his peace. Paul says that corrupt man is justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.24 I want you to observe tonight as we a look at one scripture after another, that we find that it is in Jesus, or that it is through Jesus. And whenever you read the second epistle of Peter, you will see that it is through the righteousness of God, our Savior Jesus. It is grace and peace through the knowledge of God and of our 
our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever we think about the grace of God, we should reflect upon the fact that salvation that God has so freely offered to us is entirely of God from beginning to end. Amen. Paul expresses this idea to the Ephesians. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. What a display of the then and character of the God whom we serve tonight. If you feel that you have any plea to offer to the throne of grace and mercy except the name of Jesus, you've never understood the grace of God. You have never seen the grace of God. You're still blind. If you think you can approach the throne of grace and say, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Amen. Remember the words of Peter. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you. One never ceases to be in need of grace. We all sin and we all come short of the glory of God. And whenever we look at brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to understand that we're all sinners that have been saved by God's grace. It was Solomon who said, There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. We all need the grace of God to be multiplied to us through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Christians are exhorted, according to the Hebrew writer, to come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Amen. We all have our valleys and our mountain peaks. We all fall short of the grace of God. But because of our sonship, with the Father, we can approach the throne of grace boldly. Amen. Amen. One constantly stands in need of grace. We deserve nothing but retribution and punishment and hell. And if you think you deserve it any better, you do not understand the grace of God. I say again, what a display of his being and of his holy nature. We are a demonstration of God's grace. Listen to the words of Paul when he wrote to the Christians of Ephesus. He said that even when we were dead in sin, God made us alive together with Christ. Amen. Amen. God accomplishes this. The Holy Spirit reveals to us through Jesus Christ our Savior. No wonder the angel said, and I shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. Yes, the infinite God, the eternal 
eternal God is exonerating his own eternal character through the precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through Jesus, said Peter. What a sweet and precious word that Peter uses in the introduction to his second epistle when he said, grace. There's another word that Peter employed that is very delightful to hear. And that is the word peace. The word peace, like the word grace, is more than just simply a salutation. It is grace and peace through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The Holy Spirit uses the word peace in an objective sense. That is something that is outward between God and man. That Jesus has brought about through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But it is also used in the scriptures in a subjective sense. It is a peace that is inward. It is that peace that we have with God inwardly because we know that God has redeemed us for himself through Jesus Christ of Lord. Perhaps both meanings are involved in this word peace as employed by Peter. It seems from the context that Peter is using the word to convey the rest, the satisfaction, the happiness, and the realization of peace that flows from the possession of grace. This peace is first and foremost Peace with God. Then it is emotional peace within one's being. Peace is a result of grace. And this peace is not simply inner tranquility in the psychological sense. Rather, it is the objective condition of being right with God with all the blessings that flow from His grace. Amen. One can see the excitement in the words of Paul in, in his very heart when he composes these words he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The gospel is a message of peace from God to man. At the arrival of our Lord, Luke tells us that the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Do you see why I said that the words grace and peace are pregnant words? Amen. They are full of meaning. Amen. They are words that we need to understand. No wonder the Ethiopian eunuch, after he was immersed into the Lord Jesus Christ, he went on his way 
rejoicing. Amen. Not only is there inward peace subjected within the soul, but there is outward peace, objective peace with God. Do you remember the words of Paul the Apostle when he wrote that beautiful letter we call Romans? And he said this, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Amen. And then he said, Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter informs Cornelius, quote, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel was preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Perhaps one of the most majestic statements in all of Scripture is reported in Paul's letter to the Ephesians when he said, He is our peace. Amen. The one by whom we have been brought nigh, Paul tells us, is our peace. To me, that is one of the most glorious things said about our Lord Jesus Christ. This idea exists in both the Old Testament and the New Testament with regard to the question of salvation. And perhaps one of the most beautiful statements in all of God's Word concerning this issue is found in Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead of the Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. There it is. God is the God of peace. No wonder Peter cried out, grace and, and peace be multiplied to you. This is a very good way of thinking of salvation. God saves humanity because he is a God of peace. Jacob says, that the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Amen. What is Shiloh? Shiloh is peace. The author of peace. The prince of peace. Amen. Do you remember the words of Isaiah, the prophet of God, when he penned these words through the Holy Spirit? He said, For under us a child is born, under us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. It's no wonder that all of the apostles, if I recall correctly, use grace. And generally they use peace in their salutation to the Christians to whom they wrote their letters. This is the very essence of our salvation. There is no peace apart from God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This peace is only through Jesus. They say over and over again. When God makes peace, he does something inward and outward. And the peace of God is a new relationship.
relationship of forgiveness and acceptance. Do you remember those wonderful words of Paul when he wrote to the Christians of Colossae when he said this, Jesus has made peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. On the day of his resurrection, John tells us that Jesus met with the disciples and said, Peace be unto you. Amen. In this greeting, Jesus no doubt reminds them of his propitiatory death on the cross by which he made peace for them with his Father. But what about another expression? Through the knowledge of God and Jesus. That's what this meeting is all about. And all of the brothers in Christ that have expressed their views and the sisters in Christ that have shared their views is all then concerning knowing God. What does it really mean to know God? The word knowledge is used in two different senses in the scriptures. First, it may refer to individual objects with which one is familiar, that is, with the essence of a thing or the whatness of the object. In other words, it is knowledge about things. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we just stop there, we fall short. Secondly, there is a knowledge that relates to a personal relationship between knower and the thing known. Now it's true. We cannot have a relationship with God unless we know about God. But we do not want our knowledge of God to just stop with knowledge about God and intellectual knowledge. We want a living relationship with God whom we serve. In 2 Peter 2, 2, the apostle writes about the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And the question is, what does knowledge of God and of Jesus mean? Is it simply knowledge about God and Jesus, or is it a knowledge that acknowledges the priority of God and Jesus in one's life? That is, walking with them. Amen. Is it both? Does one knowledge about who Christ is and what he has accomplished for mankind alter one's relationship with God? See, we know about God and we know about Jesus. But has it altered our relationship with God? Has it altered our relationship one with another? I wonder tonight if we truly love one another. Could it be said of us as it was said of the early martyrs, behold how they loved one another. Do we have that kind of relationship with God and with one another. It's true that one must know about Christ before he or she can know Christ or receive God's grace and peace. But what is really meant by knowing Christ? When one knows Christ, he or she has an active, living, relationship with him. Amen. 
true knowledge of God and a 
things, said Peter, that pertain unto life and godliness. Unless godliness exists in the life of the believer, one does not know God. Amen. This knowledge of God and of Jesus is not simply intellectual, but it includes experiential knowledge of both God and Jesus. You know, by reading the scriptures, I learn about the birth, ministry, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension, and the promises of Jesus' return and the attributes of God. I learned all of that by reading the scriptures. When I talk about the attributes of God, I'm, I'm talking about his love and his mercy and his kindness, his compassion. This is a part of knowing about God. It is this kind of knowledge that Peter exhorts the believers in this epistle in the last chapter. He says, grow in grace Amen. and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus and the love of God, their mercy, their justice, their compassion, should be imitated by every one of us. Paul said in Romans 15 and verse 7 that we are to receive one another even as the Lord Jesus Christ has received us to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. How has God received you? Has not God received you with imperfection in your life? Has not God received you with imperfection in your knowledge? Amen. Did not Paul say, brothers, you receive one another just as the Lord Jesus Christ received you to the glory of God? Amen. We have been received by the grace of God with all of the imperfections in our lives. And we are to extend that same love and that same kindness and that same compassion to one another. We are to be imitators of God. Amen. Amen. You know, God through Jeremiah the prophet rebuked the Israelites for not being concerned about individuals. They were insensitive to the hearts of men and women. And oh, how often are we today insensitive to the hearts of men and women, and yet we profess that we know God. You know, before we became believers, Paul said that you were hateful and you were hating one another. And it isn't uncommon to find those that are believers who are hateful and hating one another. And yet they profess that they know God In the Jeremiah passage in the 22nd chapter, I'm going to ask you, if you will, for just a moment, turn with me to Jeremiah, the, the 22nd chapter. And I want you to try to understand tonight of what it really means to know God. You see, it isn't just enough to say, well, I believe in Jesus. The devils also believe and tremble. But we need to understand something of of what it really means to know God. When I look at Jeremiah, the 22nd chapter, and I read about Jehoiakim, one of the most wicked of all the kings of Judah, 
about verse 15. He said, does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Did not your father have food and drink? He did what was right and just, so all went well with him. He said he defended the cause of the poor and the needy, and so all went well. Do you ever defend the cause of the poor and the needy? Do you ever become concerned about what is going on in the world when babies are being murdered in their mother's womb on a daily basis? When there is injustice in the judicial system, are we concerned? When we see injustice among employers to their employees, are we concerned? When we see elders sometimes that are rude and ugly to the people of God, to God's children, are we concerned? Does it bother us? Are we insensitive to the hearts, to the needs of people? Well, Jehoiakim was. And God talked about Josiah his father, he said that he defended the cause of the poor and the needy. And I want you to look at this and I want you to underscore the latter part of this verse. He said, is that not what it means to know me? Amen. See, we're talking about knowing God tonight. We need to concretize what it really means to know God. We ought not to just talk in the abstract and uh, it's somewhere out yonder like a shadowy substance just floating in the air. Turn with me again to the seventh chapter of the book of Jeremiah. And let us begin reading with about verse 7. God said, uh, do not try, or verse 4 rather in chapter 7. He said, do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood. You see, that's what it really means to know God. He said, will you still, beginning with verse 9, and murder, commit adultery, perjury, burn incense, to Baal and follow other gods, and then come and stand before me in the house which bears my name? How many of us are like that today? We say, the church, the church, the church. And we commit all of these acts that are ungodly. In the words of the Holy Spirit, he says they practice ungodliness. Look at Jeremiah, the ninth chapter. And I believe verse 23 and verse 24. It says, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him boast, let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me. What does it mean to know God? That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight. Amen. Amen. See, do we know God? Or do we just know about God? Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. And let's look at I think the 58th chapter. And let's look at verse 6. And I want you to reflect upon the words that we're going to read because 
You see, here we're seeing what it really means to know God, to walk with Him. Is this not the kind of fashion that I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Does that remind you of the words of our Lord? In the judgment saying, when I was hungry, you gave me no food. When I was thirsty, you did not give me anything to drink. When I was a stranger, you did not take me in. When I was naked, you did not close me. Oh, we've all heard the story, haven't we? Lord, I don't remember this.
There's just so much to talk about tonight, just growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord, but I'm going to just briefly hit this section of the Scripture. It is two things involved. You remember in verse 2, or verse 1, turn back to 2 Peter. I'm going to read that so that we get the context. In 2 Peter, the first chapter, and verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, the English translation indicates that there are two persons involved here. But the Greek syntax indicates in this verse, it's Jesus. One of the few passages in the New Testament where Jesus is called God. And he is dealing with the righteousness of our God, even our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the latter part of this chapter, he talked about holiness. And we talked about that. But I want us to understand very briefly tonight something about justification, about this righteousness of God. Because if we understand what God has accomplished for us, then we're going to experience this grace and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Being justified, Paul says, freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. John expresses it this way, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. John 3, 16 through 17. The doctrine of grace and peace is obtained through a knowledge of what Jesus has accomplished for humanity through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of God. Amen. In Romans 3, 19 through 20, Paul sets forth the terrifying aspects of the law. He says that the law of God shuts every man's mouth. Amen. No man, Paul says, can boast before the law of God. The apostle, though, does not leave man in despair. Like Paul said that the law was shut every man's mouth, he gives up. Two of the greatest words, perhaps, in all of Scripture. But now, Amen. aren't those beautiful words? Amen. But now, a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe, there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Amen. But now, this is the very heart of the Christian belief. This is how faith answers the indictment of the law, the accusations of the conscience, Amen. and everything else that would doom and demoralize us. There are no more wonderful words in the whole of Scripture than these two words, but now. No man has ever provided or ever will provide a righteousness that will satisfy God and the demands of his holy law. Well, is there any hope for humanity? Can nothing be done for de degenerate man? 
Are people irretrievably doomed? The apostle answers these questions. He does so in two words. But now, God's grace through Jesus has provided the righteousness that the law demands. Amen. This is what it means. To know God. To have a living, vital relationship with Him. Hopefully, as a result of this meeting, that all of us will rededicate, as it were, our lives to God. Amen. And I don't know who you are. Here tonight, perhaps there's someone that isn't right with God. I don't know. But if you're not, I beg and I plead with you to confess your faults before God and pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for such a great love that you have manifested to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that we have this knowledge of justification. And we thank you, Father, that we have the knowledge of you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For we know, Father, what Jesus went through in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and how that he reacted to people. And we remember the words that he said to Thomas, Thomas, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Father, may that we ever see you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to love one another and to be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving one another,